gravity and magnetism. And we'll cover gravity first, right? It's a force. And Isaac Newton related the gravitational force to the product of two masses. And there you see the moon, mass one, and the earth, mass two. And by the way, all the calculations in this presentation can be found in a, the paper. URL is there, but I'm also going to put it in the description so you can click on it for easy access. So gravity is a force. Right, it's a force that can uh, attract objects of any mass. Right? The moon was shown on the earlier page. People are standing on the earth right now because of gravity. Uh, even to light things like feathers. And at least in a vacuum, uh, all of those objects are going to fall at a constant rate. At our surface, that's 9.81 meters per second squared. But now imagine two people. Right? They don't experience a detectable uh, gravitational force. Right. And that's because the mass of a single person is too small for gravity to be detected. Uh, the key word there is detected. I'll go over that in a little bit. Now, the average person has 10 to the 27th power number of atoms. That's a lot of atoms, right? You can see an atom there, a single atom on the far left. But that pales by comparison to the Earth, which has 10 to the 50th power of atoms. So a heck of a lot of atoms. Magnetism, right? That's also a force. Now, within the Earth, the Earth contains an iron core, and it's responsible for its magnetic field. And what's a force? A force has the ability to move uh, objects. And so think about the compass, and uh, the force causes the needle of a compass to align with the magnetic field and point north. And the Earth has an uh, iron core, and you can think about an iron bar magnet, but there's other elements that are also magnetic, and they're magnetic when particles and their spin align. And so here's a bar magnet with a north and south pole, and you can see the field lines that are drawn. But all that originates because of this, right? A, a single particle, like the electron, has a magmet magnetic moment due to spin. So you can see the same magnetic field lines coming from a single particle. You align those, you get... Uh, magnets, such as the bar magnet. You align it in the core of the Earth, you get a magnetic field in a planet. All right, let's break this down and, and explain gravity first. All right, to explain it, let's imagine an incredibly small particle, right, radius of Planck length, and that's very small. You can see the number down there at the very bottom. And in fact, all of the uh, constant you're going to see here will appear at the bottom with their value and units. Okay, so let's do this. Let's imagine an in wave. Right? These are electric waves, longitudinal waves to be specific, converging on that particle you see on the far left. Now imagine two out waves. Right? One is longitudinal, spherical, longitudinal waves, and the other causes a motion, in this case the spin of that particle, and a second uh, out wave forms, which is, uh, depending on your view, it's, it's transverse. And longitudinal and transverse will be described in just a second. So one in wave, two different types of out waves. And these values here are going to be important for the rest of this presentation. All right, it's conservation of energy, and by the way, uh, these are wave amplitude, and energy is proportional to wave amplitude squared. So uh, energy is conserved, and it's going to be Planck charge coming in, and then what will be, I'll be shown to be the elementary charge is uh, uh, Planck charge and the square root of the fine structure constant. And then the other is the Planck charge divided by the uh, square root of the uh, fine structure constant. This will be explained in a second, but remember these values. It's going to be key. Now, the next few slides are actually taken from a, a separate paper and, and a video on that paper. Um, but it's important to just do a quick recap of this. So particles can be formed from, from charge, or they're standing longitudinal waves, right? It's an in wave and an out wave creates a standing wave. And that becomes the particle. And beyond that, it's traveling waves. And for more information, go to that paper. I'm just doing the quick recap. Um, now here is the icons that are going to be used instead. It's really hard to show uh, spherical waves. So we're going to use those arrows as the longitudinal wave, which is in the, uh, the vibration is in the direction of propagation. That's a longitudinal wave, and that's going to be the electric wave. From the poles now is going to be a transverse wave, which is uh, vibration at right angles to the direction of wave propagation, and that's going to have a separate icon there. That red spinning line is going to be the magnetic wave. Okay. 
Now, the electron's mass can be derived as following, and so can the electron's energy, and the only difference in that equation is that c squared, see a little c there. So the difference between mass and energy is wave speed, and what is a particle? Well, a particle can be measured as either mass or energy, typically because they are stored energy. And what's a standing wave? A standing wave has energy, but it's no net propagation of energy. It's stored energy. So everything that we define within that radius, Re, which is the electron's classical radius, is stored energy and becomes a particle. But energy continues to flow beyond there. We just don't call it energy because at that point, traveling waves have the ability to uh, force another particle into motion. What do we call that? We call it a force. And a force is just energy um, divided by a distance. And so that same equation you saw for energy on the previous page now has uh, r squared in the denominator instead of r, right? That's uh, energy divided by distance. That is the electric force equation. You might be more familiar with it as um, Coulomb's law, if, it, if equals uh, kqq over r squared. But that is the exact same thing. The magnetic constant is used here because of the previous page, as you can see, to um, separate energy and mass. Um, but to the left of those parentheses, uh, magnetic constant and c squared divided by 4 pi is the Coulomb constant. And then what you see there is as the elementary charge is just for two um, particles. But of course, um, uh, Q is, the, uh, is a, uh, the number of particles times the elementary charge. So that is Coulomb's law, just uh, shown in a different way. Okay, that's a quick recap. So uh, let's do this. N waves um, are reflected as uh, longitudinal out waves. And if you want a better visual of this, think about sound waves, for example. Those are longitudinal waves bouncing off a balloon. Most of that energy is reflected. But what if it causes a slight turn of that balloon? Then you would have a second uh, waveform. But that slight difference of in wave and out wave energy results in this, right? A net longitudinal in wave. And due to the conservation of energy, that energy uh, equals that magnetic spin coming out. Okay, all this will make sense when we put equations to it and can prove it. So let's do this first. Let's calculate that um, longitudinal energy. It's really small by comparison right, uh, of what is lost, and it occurs at the core at Planck length and extends out to the particle standing wave radius which is the electron's classical radius. Now you square that ratio and apply the fine structure constant, and you get what's called the electron gravitational coupling constant to the right. Now that energy loss, you know what you're going to see in magnetism is really small, right? What's energy uh, mc squared, so we're going to take the electron's mass, uh, c squared, and then apply that uh, coupling constant. Um, but gravity is measured as a force. We're going to take that energy divided by distance, and that distance is going to be applied at electron's radius. And this equation at the bottom right is going to be used later. So remember that. I'll show the equation later, but just remember this one. But first, that energy loss is really small. Um, and remember that longitudinal waves are still being reflected. The vast majority of them are being reflected, and that is the electric force. So gravity pales by comparison to the electric force, and it's not detected for two particles. Um, but you can take the force of um, gravity and divide it by the force of uh, electricity, and that's, um, this is where we start to see the gravitational constant g and Coulomb's constant k. You don't see the r squared in the equation there on the bottom left because they cancel out, but that's essentially Coulomb's law and Newton's law. Notice that it's the exact same value as electron gravitational coupling constant. That's no coincidence. Those forces are a result of that ratio. So gravity pales by comparison to the electric force. But let's just say that electric force is neutralized. Right? So in the absence of any electric force, what would happen? If there's slight net energy of spherical longitudinal end waves that creates pressure on a particle. But now when you put two or more of those together, you get a shading effect of pressure. Same thing as the radiation pressure, which is witnessed. Right? And what does that do? It forces two particles together. So gravity is not a pull force, it's a push force. But the electric force does exist, right? So gravity remains undetected for two particles. Um, and remember that ratio, the gra ratio of the gravitational force to electron force. It would take 10 to the 43 power number of electrons with gravitational force equal just the electric force of two electrons, a lot of electrons. Um, 
We're going to be showing atoms later, so it's worth noting that it takes 10 to the 37th power of protons equal that same electric force of two electrons. You do that by taking the proton to electron mass ratio and squaring it. Anyway, what has that number of protons and electrons and atoms? Well, a large body like Earth. Right, that explains why we see it in large bodies. Okay, from earlier, the force of gravity for a single electron mass, remember this one, at its radius was that. All right, that's a force equation. Now, Newton established the force of gravity as a product of two masses, and he had to insert the proportionality constant, uh, gravitational constant, known as g. So, for example, two electrons, you see g in the mass of two electrons, and, and uh, separated by its radius there. Well, that's a problem for a uh, force equation, which in units has one mass, and so you have to account for that in the proportionality constant g. So how do you solve for that? All right, you take that force equation in the top left, you uh, bring the mass down to the de uh, denominator and the radius up to the numerator, and now the masses cancel out uh, in terms of, of units, and you, when, what do you get? you get the derivation now of the gravitational constant in both value in bo and also units and with an explanation now for the constant g. Oh, but wait, just there's a lot more. Because we're going to get to magnetism now and explain how magnetism is related to gravity. So let's do this. Let's consider a particle that spins in one of two directions, counterclockwise or clockwise, and it creates two transverse waves at its pole. Poles. Now, the magnetic moment for the electron is actually a strange one in terms of units. It's not energy or forces, which uh, would make life a lot easier to be able to explain everything. Its units is something called joules per tesla. Um, but everything else so far has been measuring coulombs, uh, which is the unit for charge, as wave amplitude. And wave amplitude is uh, distance, right? So meters and SI units. When you do that conversion, you can see joules per tesla there at the bottom left, um, it becomes a volumetric flow rate, meters cubed per second, which is a lot, makes a lot easier, makes a lot more sense to explain magnetism now. It's flowing out of the electron at that rate. And what is the electron's magnetic moment? It's known as the Bohr magneton. So let's derive that now, right, with a wave speed of c, right, that's the speed of light, how all the electromagnetic waves travel at that speed. Uh, measured uh, flowing out of the electron's radius at that amplitude earlier. Remember, the amplitude is Planck charge divided by the square root of the fine structure constant. Now, we're measuring it at one pole, right? There's two poles, so we take half of that. And what do you get when you put all that up together? You get the volumetric flow rate in terms of units that I explained, but you also get the value of the Bohr magneton. It's a flow rate. Now, because of the Planck length relationship, the electron's gravitational coupling constant, see that flashing arrow there, it can also be used. You take the Planck charge and, and um, the uh, Planck length and, and the speed of light, divide that by the electron's um, square root, at least the electron's gravitational coupling constant. What do you get? You get the Bohr magneton. So that's the, one of the first uh, equations now that directly relates gra gravity and magnetism. All right, there is more. So an electron paired with a proton creates the simplest atom, which is hydrogen. And the electron is also known to orbit, uh, the most probable orbital distance at least, is known as the Bohr radius. And there it is. Now the flow rate has to be described flowing through something. So we're gonna take a volume here. Right? In between the electron and the proton, we're going to take a cross-sectional area of the electron, pi r e squared, and we're going to multiply that by the length or radius, and we get a cylindrical volume. So let's put that cylinder here as the energy between the electron and the proton. And then now let's take the Bohr magneton, square it, for um, flow rate coming in and out of the electron, uh, flowing through that volume. Uh, with a linear density of magnetic constant. If you do those units now, you get units of energy. So we've made an energy equation. And if you look at that value, that energy, that magnetic energy between the electron and proton is exactly equal to the rest energy of the electron. All right, so now that proton and electron forms hydrogen and other elements form our, our atoms neutralizing the electric force. And you put all those together, they make 
all sorts of different things, including people, but also large bodies like uh, Earth and like the moon and stars like the sun. Right? They contain a significant number of atoms such that now that same shading effect that was shown for two particles uh, actually can be detected. Gravity is the measurable force in a large body, and it's the same shading effect of that individual particles, but it can be detected due to the sheer number of particles in these planets and moons. And magnetic fields may form in large bodies, you know, like the Earth when particles spin a line. That was shown earlier. The iron core creates the magnetic field, but it's the electric fields. Um, what, what comes into each of and every one of these particles is conservation of energy causing them to spin that links gravity to magnetism. And you can even see it at a macro level here. We saw it at the particle level, but you can see at a macro level here that even Earth's magnetic field is intricately linked to its gravitational force. And it's because of every spinning particle on and within the Earth.